Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> My goodness, it's good to be here this morning. I know it may look gray outside and be a gray day, but we have the light of the Lord in here. If we're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got that light shining. And it is good to see this crowd here today. So this morning, worship with us today. Praise the Lord because he is worthy to be praised. So this morning, I 
Just a few quick announcements. On uh, Wednesday, September 29th, we've got the Hightower Associ Association meeting, uh, 9 a.m. at Hopewell Baptist Church. And then we've got Wednesday night church. On um, We've got the classes meeting outside, so if you're a part of one of those classes, keep coming. I, I believe they're having a great time, so come out and join us there. Um, the FBC is... Co is collecting gift cards for the Georgia Baptist Children's Home. All gift cards will be taken to this meeting, uh, then delivered to the children's home. So if you're wanting to donate to the Georgia Baptist Children's Home, I know it's an amazing mission. They help thousands of kids across this state uh, to find a good home and to find a good, stable environment to live in, and they learn about the Lord. So that's even better. So if you're wanting to donate to this uh, worthy cause, you can bring in donations, and then those cards will be given at the meeting. Uh, gift cards can be placed in offering plates or given to Darren Sharp or um, our pastor. So if you want to donate, you can see either one of them or you can drop it in the offering plate. Uh, Sunday, October 3rd, uh, Sunday School and Assembly is back at 9.45 a.m. So come join us then. And conference will be right after the worship service. It will be the first Sunday in October. So uh, feel free to stay for that. And then Christmas backpacks will be due October the 3rd uh, for children's ages 2 to 17. I know that's an amazing ministry. And again, they help a lot of kids in the places where they drop these backpacks off. And um, if you've ever seen the videos of those kids receiving those backpacks, it's, it is truly a blessing to see their faces light up when they get those backpacks. So items needed, if you're wanting to do a backpack, they're needing toys, hygiene items, school supplies, clothing, gloves, um, and there's all kinds of ways that you can help. You can prepare a backpack, or you can donate items, or you can even donate through giving online. If you're unable to go out and um, actually do a backpack, you can still give online. So there's plenty of ways to be a part of these um, Christmas backpacks. And if you have any questions, you can contact uh, Miss Janet Clack and she'll be glad to answer them. And then Monday, October 4th, we have the WMU meeting at 6 p.m., and then Saturday, October 9th, it's the Hightower uh, Food and Clothing Bank. That's FBC Volunteer Day, by the way. So that's our church's day to go out and help with this awesome ministry. That'll be at 7.30 a.m. through 12 p.m. And then Sunday, October 10th, Brotherhood is back, and that is also Pastor Appreciation Day that day. So please come out and support our pastor, I know he does a lot for this church, and we are very blessed for that. And then uh, we have Thursdays in October, sen uh, Super Senior Lunch at the Paget Lake House, 12 p.m. I don't have a date for that, so is there anybody here that can give me a date for that one? Is there a day? October, October the 12th. Okay, so October the 12th, that Thursday. Um, Super Senior Lunch at the Paget Farm, and I know they have a good time there. Those people know how to have a good time. I've been a part of it myself, and it's awesome. And then Sunday, October 31st, Hope is here. Hope is here, and make plans now to join us for a fun-filled day, and more details will be coming soon as that time gets closer. So keep that in mind, October 31st, Hope is here. And is there anything else, I believe? That's about it. So if um, I could have the ushers come up for the offering. And as they're coming up, Caleb, will you lead us in prayer? Yes. Oh, sorry, Janice, did you have? Okay, sorry, Tuesday, Tuesday, October the 12th, Super Seniors. Okay, so Tuesday. Okay, so no okay, so no Wednesday night this week due to fall break. Thank you for clarifying that. All right, Caleb. Bow your heads. Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to gather here together, God, Lord, to worship you. Lord, as we go into the rest of this worship service, Lord, and into the preaching, God, we ask that you Lord focus our minds on you, Lord, Lord, so we can be blessed and be fed through your word, God. Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we love you, and we ask you to forgive us of our many sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
And I will have y'all stand. We're going to be singing a very familiar song. So join in with us as we sing, Are You Washed in the Blood? This next one we're going to be singing is an, another familiar one, so y'all sing along with us. Um, it's one that we haven't sang in a while, but it's, yeah, <laughs> we've never, as a group, we've never sang it at all, but it's a very familiar song, and it's beautiful, the words that are written in it. So y'all listen and sing as we sing in the garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the sun Closes and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy. 
he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the
sound of dry bones rattling. This is a praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones Make a dead man walk again. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. in the first degree the Son of God hanging on a hill Hell was my destiny The crowd was shouting crucify Could have come from these lips of mine Dirty shame was killing me. It would take a miracle to wash me clean. Then I read the red letters and the ground began to shake. Prison
Y'all hear that? Y'all hear it? I hear some dry bones rattling. Wow. <clears throat> Those songs today have made my message, um, I guess that much more important as far as if we listen to the message of the songs, then we won't really have an issue with, with the message today. If we listen to the message of the songs, it'll take care of what we want to talk about today. I've had a blessed week. I've had a difficult week, and God has been good through every bit of it. Amen. I took part in a funeral service, I attended another funeral service, and I conducted a wedding yesterday evening. When I do weddings, I always do something. Most people are focused on the bride as she comes down the aisle, but I like to watch the groom. He's usually standing there with me, and so I turn and watch the groom because I want to see his reaction when his bride comes down the aisle. And when I looked over at Joe... Andrade yesterday evening, I got the reaction I was looking for. The tears began to roll. So I'll give a shout out to Joe and Amanda this morning, and they have been watching for some time our services online, and I appreciate that very much. And I wish them the best in their new life together. Life is full of new life, and it's full of the fact that life comes to an end. I pulled in Sony View Gardens the other day, and as we drove through around to where the gravesite was, my wife, I was talking with her on the phone, and I said, I've never in all my days of coming in this particular cemetery, I've never, never seen so many tents and so many graves opened ready for someone to be planted back into the Mother Earth. They were everywhere. Never, never seen that many. And I couldn't help but wonder, what, what is it all about? It's about the same thing it's always been about. We live, and one day we're going to die. I mean, it's just, all of, all of my life, I never, Michelle and I never sheltered our children from death. We, we never have. I, I've been a pastor all their lives, and so they have been to hospitals. They have been to convalescent homes. They have been to funeral homes. It's all they've ever known. And so we never tried to make it a secret that one day death's going to find all of us. Unless, of course, the Lord comes back. And wouldn't that be something if he just came back and took us all home and there we were with him? But 
but we know it's a fact of life. We know it's going to happen. But we don't have to dread it, and we don't have to fear it. We don't have to be afraid when that time comes. And so what's on my heart this morning is, is one word, and that word is fear. Fear. I'm going to read you some definitions, and then we'll make some observations here from God's word. The word fear is an emotion of alarm and agitation. And it's caused by the expectation or the realization of danger. So an emotion of alarm and agitation caused by an expectation or the realization of danger. It's a ground for dread or apprehension. It's to be afraid or to be frightened of something. It's to be anxious or apprehensive about something. It's to be afraid or even terrified. But there's another definition, a couple of them that I'll share with you. And listen to this. It's extreme reverence or awe as toward a supreme power. It's to be in awe of something. It's to revere something. So I'll say this today, there's a good fear and there's a bad fear. There's one that we should avoid. There's one that really as believing Christians, as, as people who say we are saved by the grace of God, who have the Spirit of God living within us, that first, those first several definitions I read you really shouldn't be a part of our life. But those second that second group of definitions that I shared with you, that ought to be what we're all about. That type of fear is a good fear. It's a healthy fear. It's one that, that the world needs to have. But I'm afraid that oftentimes my life is ruled and, and, and controlled by those emotions. I spoke with a pastor friend of mine yesterday and he, he's, he was dealing with a message that he's preaching probably right now as I'm preaching to you. And he said, I, I've got to talk about feelings. I've got to talk about emotions. Because oftentimes we get caught up in both of them. We get caught up in feelings and emotions. And, and we make rash decisions based on those feelings and on those emotions. We don't really think things through. We just act. And oftentimes we act out of fear. We act out of anxiety, apprehension, dread. We act because we're frightened, we're afraid, we're even terrified. And so we act and we make decisions that later or even at the time we know is probably not right. Fear. So does the Bible say anything at all about fear? Absolutely it does. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, there's one verse that we'll look at for the time being. We'll probably refer to some others. But let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 and look at verse 7. This is Paul writing to a young pastor, a man that he loved very much. Paul knew the, what uh, Timothy was going to face in his work in the ministry. Paul knew the fears and the dreads and the anxieties that this young man had because let me tell you something, Paul had many of the same things. He experienced many of the same things in his own ministry. And so as he writes to uh, Timothy in this uh, Second uh, Timothy, the book of Second Timothy, we believe most likely it was a short time later when Paul literally gave his life for the cause of Christ and and this letter is, 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 in a sense, kind of a goodbye to Timothy. Paul knows his time on this earth is drawing to a close. His days are numbered. And he's going to go be with the Lord. And he wants to encourage Timothy in the work of the ministry. And I want to encourage you today in the work of the ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, 
God has not given us the spirit of fear. Notice what it says. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I like that verse. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I listened to a pastor this past week. As a pastor, I need someone to pastor me. As a pastor, I need someone to preach to me. And so I have, you know, I have a pastor friend that I listen to uh, on a regular basis. Brother Tim Strickland, pastors Mountain Creek Baptist Church in Pendergrass, Georgia, a good friend of mine. He's preached at this very pulpit during our revival. And I call him my pastor. I listen to him on a regular basis. I need preaching to. And I listened to another pastor this past week. And someone had sent me this message and said, it's worth your time. Listen to this. It was from the, this past Sunday. And I listened to the message. And during this message, this pastor said this. And, and I'll go ahead and confess, I did not check his statistics. I didn't go back. I, did, I just took his word for it. I, I felt a connection through the Spirit of God. I felt he was preaching the truth. I felt he had done his homework, knew what he was talking about. So I'll share what he shared with us in that message. He said 10% of the people are doing all the work in the average church. 10% of the people are doing all the work in the average church. He said, that, he said there's 40% that are not going to do anything. 40%. But he said there's good news. He said it has been discovered that the other 50% are just waiting to be asked. How about that? 10% doing the work, 40% just won't do anything, but 50% are just simply waiting to be asked, what can I do? And I thought about that, and I thought about what he said, and I wondered, you know, is it really true? I think we've got a good bunch of folks at Friendship Church. I, I think... People love the Lord. They want to serve the Lord. They want to do what they can. I think you love your neighbors. You love your family. You love your church. You want to see people saved by the grace of God. I believe that. But I think sometimes there's something that, that keeps us from really going all out from God, from really giving it all to Him, from really doing everything that we know God has given us to do in this life. I'm not saying everyone is called to preach. I'm not saying everyone has a gift to sing. I'm not saying everyone is supposed to be a Sunday school teacher or a singer or a deacon or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying at all. But God has gifted us and given us all different talents. Why don't we fully give that over to God who has given it to us to begin with? He knows what we're capable of. If he calls us to it, he will certainly give us the tools to get us through it and to get the job done. I believe that. But I believe this one word holds us back oftentimes, and that word is fear. Fear. Fear of failure. Fear of being called out for something that we've done that, I mean, I, I, if I've learned anything in 30 years of pastoring, I know this. There's absolutely no way to make everyone happy all the time. And as a pastor, oftentimes I feel like I've got to be a, a peacemaker. I want everybody to love each other and everybody to get along. And, and, I, and I want to sympathize here and I want to sympathize here. And, and, I, and I want to stay in the middle because I don't. But, but sometimes it's just impossible. And the realization comes to me oftentimes the only one that I need to please is Almighty God Himself. Amen. And if I'm pleasing God, then most likely, I'm not going to be pleasing people all the time. Most likely, this is another thing the pastor said last week. He said, if we're not meeting the devil head on, then evidently we're walking right along with him. Because if we're going against what the devil says, then we're going to meet him head on. There's going to be that clash. So do we just want to stroll along with the devil or do we want to fight him with everything that's in us? 
But preacher, I'm afraid of the devil. So am I. And then there's the other extreme that says, oh, there ain't no need to fear the devil. The devil ain't nothing. I beg your pardon. You know what he is? He's the prince of this world. And the prince of this world, as as such, he's given great power. And he will use that power to exercise authority over anybody and anyone at any time, even you and I as believing Christians. And you know how he does it? One of his greatest weapons is fear. Fear, anxiety, apprehension, worry. What if, what if, what if? So I think fear plays a big part in those things. So Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, God did not give us that. God did not give us a spirit of fear. And the word spirit comes from the word pneuma. And it's, it, think about a current of air. Think about the wind blowing. You see the effects of the wind. We see the tr trees as they wave. We see the leaves. We feel it on our face. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know where it's going, but we know it's there. And that's how the Spirit of God is in our lives. So he's not giving us a spirit of fear. And, and also when you think about that, you, you think about the very breath that we, that we breathe. You think about our mental disposition. All of those things. But the word fear here, God has not given us a spirit of fear. The word fear in this New Testament passage comes from the word dalia. And it means timidity. And it's from a root word, dalos, dalia, dalos, dread, timid, faithless. None of those sounds good, do they? Dread, timid, faithless. So really you could say God has not given us a mental disposition of dread and timidity and faithlessness. That's not what God is. That's not what he's about. That's not what he wants for his people. He doesn't want us to go around being timid and fearful and faithless and dreading things. And yet oftentimes that's exactly where I find myself. So God has not given us the spirit of fear. That's the God, that didn't come from God. But listen to what he has given us. He's given us power. Power. And I love it. I love it. I, I had looked this up before. I knew this, but, but I had to verify. I wanted just to make absolutely sure before I said this. That word power, a Greek word, dunamis. Guess what English word comes from that? The word dynamite. Now you think about dynamite. That's a powerful substance, isn't it? You can take a little bit of dynamite and do a whole lot of damage, right? Because it's got so much power. So the word power here is the word where our English word dynamite comes from. <clears throat> and it means, listen to this, miraculous power, ability, abundance, might, strength. It means a mighty work. This is what Paul's saying when he writes to Timothy and says, God has not given you a mental disposition of dread and timidity and faithlessness, but he has given you power. He's given you miraculous power. He's given you an ability and an abundance. And he's given you all of these things. He's given you strength to get the job done. If you're afraid, Timothy, it is not from God because he will not give you that. Paul knew what he was going to face. Folks, you and I, because he had been there, he had faced it himself. The fact is, you and I today face a lot of uncertainty. But if we let it strike that fear in our heart, that timidity, that faithlessness, that dread, then we need to know that's not from God. It's not of him. Because he, so Paul said, God has not given us that spirit of fear. But he's given us one of power. 
Look what else. Love. Not just any love. I've said this a thousand times. I said this to the couple as I counseled with them the other evening. I said, I love banana pudding. And I love 55 Chevrolets. And I love my wife. But I certainly hope I love my wife different than I love banana pudding and I love 55 Chevrolets. You know what I mean? We throw that word around, well, I love this and I love that. And man, last night I was loving me some Georgia Bulldogs. I really was. But we throw that word around so loosely sometimes. And I think that's why in the world that we live in today that we have such an extremely high divorce rate because people throw love around so flippantly. I think oftentimes love, maybe is, you know, uh, lust is mistaken for love and so on and so forth. Amen. But I think sometimes it's simply because love has become so commonplace. We use it for everything. Man, I love that television show. Man, I love that movie. Man, I love this pair of shoes. It really is one of my favorite pairs. But you know what? I love my granddaughter. And I certainly hope I love her different than I love the shoes I've got on. So the kind of love that we're talking about here, the kind of love that Paul's talking to Timothy about is agape. It's godly love. Listen to this. It's affection or benevolence. It's that all-in kind of love. It's that love where you love them. You know what? Uh, as bad as I could be sometimes and, and the sleepless nights I caused my poor old mama grow, when I was uh, growing up and when I reached my teenage years and thought I knew it all, I'm telling you what, my mama just kept loving me through all of that. Amen. She loved me through every bit of that. And that's the kind of love I'm talking about. Paul, Paul told Timothy, he said, listen, Timothy, God's not about giving you fear. He's not about your mental disposition being one of timidity and faithlessness and dreadfulness. That's not what God's about. He's wanting you to have mighty, miraculous power. And he's wanting you to have the same kind of love that he is showering upon you each and every day. That's what God's all about. And he's not changed. Listen to me. He has not changed. Amen. God is the same yesterday. He's the same today. And he'll be the same 100,000 years from now if time goes on that long. You know what we want to do with God? We want to take our little box and open it up and take God out and set him over here when we need him. And then when the crisis passes, we want to take him back up and put him back in the box and close him up and say, now you be a good God, we'll, get, we'll come back when, you, when we need you. Amen? And then listen to what else. Paul's not done. He says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. And listen to this. This might be the best part. And a sound mind. Man. I've shared with you as of late that Sometimes I lay down in my bed and, and my mind is not sound. I can't go to sleep. It won't stop. Everything just keeps crashing in and over and over and over and, and on and on and on. And I, I turn on this side and I turn on this side and I lay on my back and, and I listen to my CPAP machine and, and I'm supposed to be sleeping and, and that's just, that, there it is. That's not a sound mind. Because a sound mind is self-controlled. Comes from a word. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher this something fierce. Sophronizo. And it, makes, it means to make of sound mind. It means to discipline or correct. It means teach to be sober. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us one of power, miraculous, mighty power, and agape love. And, 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 he's, and he's teaching us to be sober-minded, to be disciplined, to have a sound mind. Is this making sense today? 
God doesn't want us running around afraid and fearful. We, 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 we don't make good decisions when, we, when we're that way. We make rash, shoot from the hip. Now let me say this. Let me say this. It is foolish if I turned on the stove and turned the eye wide open and waited till it got good glowing orange, good and hot. It would be foolish for me to say, well, I'm not afraid of that and just go and lay my hand on that stove eye. Would that not be completely foolish? So does God not give us a sense of common sense? A sense? My, my daddy growing up, this was, you know, good old horse sense. My daddy has been known to say something like, that poor old fella ain't got the sense God gave a billy goat. I act that way sometimes. Billy goats would probably make better decisions than I've made. But I think you can have that type of fear, but it's used in the good way. It's used in extreme reverence. I'm in, you know, I'm going to revere that hot stove. I'm not going to go lay my hand on it because I know better. I know to stay away from that. We ought to have that same kind of fear when it comes to sin and things in our lives that we know ought not to be there. We reverence it enough and we respect it enough to know that it's going to come back and bite us if we mess with it. And so this is what Paul is trying to get across to this young pastor during troubling times, during times when he knew the church was going to face and was facing persecution and would continue to face persecution. Timothy, don't quit. Don't let fear strangle you. Don't let fear keep you from doing anything. Listen, if anything, the right kind of fear motivates us to action. That reverent awe, that reverent fear, that in awe of who God is, that our, our supreme, he, he is the all in all. And that type of fear, uh, it moves us to action. You know what the other kind of fear moves us into? Inaction. We don't do anything because we're afraid. Paralyzed by fear. Am I the only one that knows what that's like? <laughs> I wrote this statement down. I believe fear plays a big part in whether people do or don't do. Whether we do or whether we don't do, fear plays a huge part. A huge part. Well, I thought I was going to get into something else, but you know what? God says otherwise. And we're just going to listen. And I'll tell y'all a good one. In the funeral service the other day, I had my scriptures written out, written down. It was myself and another pastor. I went first. I got to a certain point, and it's almost as if the Lord said, that's it, you're done. And so I stopped. The other pastor get up, and you know what scripture he read? The very next scripture that I had on my list to read. So I showed him my notes when we got outside. I said, look at this. I said, this was where I was going next. He said, I'm sure glad you didn't. He said, I don't know what I would have done if you would have done that. But you know what I say to that? God is good. God is good. 1 John 4 and 16. Well, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. John 14. John chapter 14. The last part of verse 27 says this. And these are the words of Jesus Christ himself. We better listen. Jesus Christ himself. John 14, the last part of verse 27 says, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Isn't that good? It's what Jesus said. So what he's saying there, he's saying, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be dreadful, apprehensive, frightened, anxious. 
Don't let it be terrified. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And in 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, John again, the, the apostle John, listen to what he says. There is no fear in love. Did you catch that? There's no fear in love, but perfect love, love that's complete, love that's whole, perfect love casts out fear. It does away with it because fear has torment. And that word torment, it, it gives you the, the idea of punishment. I saw that in, when I was looking up, you know, about torment and, and where the word where it comes from. And, it, and it, it gives you the idea of punishment. So he says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, complete, whole love, casts out fear because fear has torment. And listen to this. Pay attention. He that fears not, he that fears is not made perfect in love. In other words, if we're fearful, if we're timid, if we're apprehensive, if we're full of dread, and that dominates our life, he says, we've not been made complete in love. Something to think about for all of us. Something to consider. Because I've been there, haven't you? I've been there. So what, what, what do we need to focus on today? We need to focus on power. We need to focus on love. And we need to focus on a, a sound mind. Because Paul told Timothy, that's what comes from God. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. He doesn't give us that mindset, that mental disposition uh, uh, of, of timidity and faithlessness and dread. That's not God. But he gives us miraculous, mighty power. He gives us that agape, godly love that we can share with others. And he gives us a mind of self-control, sober-mindedness, discipline. That's what God is all about. And that's what we need today. Yes, Amen. Yes. That's what we need. I can guarantee you something. I can guarantee you. Our hope does not lie in Republicans, in Democrats, in the President of the United States in our Congress, in our Supreme Court. Our hope does not lie in any of those things. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we need to pray for all of those that I just listed. All of those that I just listed needs to be on our prayers. The Bible says pray without ceasing. So does that mean we just run around all the time just praying, 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 praying? Listen to me. Praying without ceasing means that a Christian goes with a spirit of prayer about us at any given time. We can stop and we can take a moment to pray and talk to God and know and understand with everything within us that God's listening. Amen. And we don't have to be afraid to approach Him. And we don't have to be afraid to be bold. You know why I say that? If you believe that there's something about you that needs to come before God all timid and shy and, you know, cowering back, just go ahead and read the Psalms because those fellas got blunt with God. And I believe he wants us to be blunt with him too. Why not? Because he already knows our heart, Amen. right? He already knows what we're thinking. So if we think we can just not say it and God's not going to know, we've already thought it, he already knows. Let's just be honest with God. Come boldly before the throne of grace and just see what God will do for his people. That's the message today. I hope you've gotten something out of it. And uh, like I say, I thought we would go get into more, but there's, it's not necessary. Maybe it'll be for another time. <laughs> Maybe it will be. I was privileged to attend the funeral service in First Baptist Church of Atlanta of 
Harry Maddox, that's Dennis Grendel, our own Dennis Grendel here at Friendship. It's his brother, his older brother, Harry. And the pastor there talked about Enoch. He talked about how Enoch walked in. He was justified in the eyes of God. And then the Bible says Enoch walked with God. So he walked on. He walked in and he continued to walk on with God. And then he just walked out. God took him, the Bible says. And he was not. You know what all that's about? That was a life well lived. He walked in. He walked on with God. And then he just walked right on out with him. <laughs> and he compared that to the life of Harry Maddox. And I thought, man, what, what a... What a testimony of that man's, wow. What, if that could be said of me one day, that, well, he walked in, he walked on with God for a while, and then he just walked on out with him. No better words could be spoken, people. Just walk on. Walk on, even in the midst of Everything that's going on, just walk on. Walk on with Jesus. Because I promise you the end result is going to be worth it. There's not a single one of us here. I, I don't believe anyone has ever got to heaven. Y'all going to get so tired of hearing me say this, but I, I believe it with all my heart. Not a single one's ever going to get to heaven and walk through them pearly gates and look around and go, well, this ain't what I was expecting. What a letdown. I believe we'll be so amazed and so dumbfounded and just so caught up in the moment. And just, and just think about, just think about the throne. Just think about Jesus. And think about all the countless millions that will just be gathered as far as the eye can see in every direction. And there's Jesus right in the midst. The Bible says there won't even need to be a sun or a moon because the Son of God is going to be all the light that we need. So I'm going to ask you something. Is there anything on the face of this earth that we ought to be afraid of when we've got that to look forward to? And when we can experience it right now today. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? If you've been saved by the grace of God, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, He lives in you. We don't have to wait till sometime out yonder to experience the joy of our salvation. He's saying, go ahead and experience it now. I want you to. Because I've not given you a spirit of timidness and fearfulness and dreadfulness. I'm not giving you that. I've given you power, miraculous, mighty power. I've given you love unlike anything the world has ever known. And I've given you a sound mind to where you can take all this in. You talk about, that's the God we serve, people. That's Him. That's Him. So what do we have to be afraid of today? Let's use that good definition of fear. That one of reverence and awesomeness and respect for God and who he is and what he's all about. Because there's nothing wrong with that fear. That's the kind we all need. Amen. If you don't know him today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've never had that experience in your life, you've never given your heart to him, today would be a good day to be saved. Today, right here at Friendship Baptist Church, you can just bow and admit to God that you're a sinner, that you've done wrong, that you have messed up, and you need a Savior in your life. And then believe that Jesus Christ is that Savior, that he died on the cross and shed his blood. They placed him in a tomb, and on the third day, as the song said, he came out, <laughs> and he's alive and he makes intercession for you and I on a daily basis. And we're going to see him one day. And then just tell somebody, Jesus is my Savior. That pastor at Harry's funeral the other day, 
he asked everybody to bow their heads. He said, every eye closed. And he prayed. He said, if you're here and you're lost and you need to be saved, he said, I'm not, I, I'm not, he said, I'm not trying to embarrass you. He said, but I want you to pray. He said, I'm going to pray, but I want you to pray and ask Jesus to save you. And he prayed that prayer. And he, he raised, he said, every head bowed. He said, now, if you prayed that prayer and, and you believe that Jesus Christ has come in your life, he said, would you just slip your hand up? And there were hands that went up. How about that? We can only trust and believe that someone was honest with him and most of all that they were honest with God. That it was more than just a prayer, more than just being caught up in the moment, more than just a feeling or an emotion, but that it was a true commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can do that today while we stand together and while they sing.
good stuff. Thank you so much for being here today. And, and let's go away from this place not in a spirit of fear, because that's not from God, but in that power and that love and that sound mind that is from God. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for those of you that are visiting. We got some Coal Mountain folks here. We love them very much. Bobby and Sylvia, they're so special to us, and we thank them for coming and worshiping with us today. And just all of you, we thank you for coming. We love you, and just keep praying. I uh, want to shout out to Miss.